I need to give you a quick introduction uh, to this chapter, and then we'll read actually verses 1 through 30. It's a lengthy text, but uh, just to give you a little bit of background before we go right into it, uh, King David's army has just defeated the forces of Absalom, his rebel son. It's a resounding victory. It's really miraculous. Uh, and God destroyed those who rebelled against David, the Lord's anointed. However, for David, it was an incredibly sad victory. His son Absalom is now dead. And perhaps you remember the story of him getting caught up in a tree and then killed by Joab and some of his men. So that gives you some background. Verses 1 through 30, what we'll do is we'll look at Joab the general rebuking David. And then we'll see the return of the king. David returns to his royal city of Jerusalem from which he has fled. And we'll see David's incredible mercy plus the responses of his subjects. Now, this is chapter 19, verse 1 through 30. Then it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom. The victory that day was turned to mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day, The king is grieved for his son. So the people went by stealth into the city that day, as people who are humiliated steal away when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son Absalom! Oh, Absalom, my son, my son! Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have covered with shame the faces of all your servants, who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, surely not a man will pass the night with you. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. So the king rose and sat in the gate when they told all the people, saying, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. Then all the people came before the king. Now Israel had fled, each to his tent. All the people were quarreling throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. But now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. However, Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now then, why are you silent about bringing the king back? Then King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the word of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house? You are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? Say to Amasa, who was Joab's, uh, rather, who was the general of uh, Absalom, why are you not my, uh, rather, are you not my bone and my flesh? May God do so to me and more also, if you will not be commander of the army before me continually in the place of Joab. Thus he turned the hearts of all the men of Judah as one man, so that every, so that they sent word to the king, saying, Return, you and all your servants. The king then returned and came as far as the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal in order to go to meet the king, to bring the king across the Jordan. Then Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, who was from Bahurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and twenty servants with him. And they rushed to the Jordan before the king. Then they kept crossing the ford to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. So he said to the king, Let not my lord consider me guilty, nor remember what your servant did wrong on the day when my lord the king came out from Jerusalem, so that the king would take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today, the first of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, said, Should not Shimei... Be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? David then said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zariah, that you should this day be an adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel today? 
For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? The king said to Shimei, You shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. Then Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and he had neither cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came home in peace. It was then he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said to him, Why did you not come with me, Mephibosheth? So he answered, O my lord, the king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride it and go with the king because your servant is lame. Moreover, he has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But my lord, the king, is like an angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your sight. For all my father's household was nothing but dead men before my lord, the king. Yet you set your servant among those who ate at your own table. What right do I have yet that I should complain any more to the king? So the king said to him, Why do you still speak of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Let him even take it all, since my lord the king has come safely to his own house. Now may the Lord bless the reading of his word today and our time of it this morning. Let's pray. Well, we are in 2 Samuel chapter 19. I read the passage, and as I said, it's, it, you could almost divide it in half in the two in the places that we're going to be looking today. We'll see Joab, and he, he gives a very strong rebuke of David, and I think rightfully so. Um, and then we'll see how David returns, what mercy he shows, and you'll see the different responses of his subjects. So this is the Word of God, verse 1 through 4, I'll read this again. Then it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom. The victory that day was turned to mourning for all the people, for the people heard it and said that day the king is grieved for his son. So the people went by stealth into the city that day as people who are humiliated steal away when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now, to be clear, let me give you a little bit of background here. David has fled Jerusalem as his wicked son Absalom has come and taken it over. And David and his men went to Mahanaim, which is on the uh, eastern side of the Jordan. And uh, then they go out and fight this battle at the previous chapter. Well, uh, David seems to be far outnumbered. 20,000 people die. Uh, Josephus said that David only had 4,000 men. So um, God did a miraculous work. And you see that actually even the forest worked against Absalom. The forest of Ephraim killed more of the people than the battle itself. So David is now in the city of Mahanaim. He's just found out that his son has died. And uh, his men, who are coming back victorious, are hit with terrible disappointment humiliation in some ways as they enter the city gate because we see in the previous chapter that David is now up in his upper chamber over the city gate and he's weeping and it's loud and so the men are whose voice is it that's the king they kind of tiptoe their way back in Um, and you're wondering what's the reason for his grief well obviously the loss of his son Uh, But I think there's something more, and I'll put it into three different points here. The first one is clear. David is weeping with a law that you and I perhaps have wept with ourselves, and that's called the law of sowing and reaping. David realizes this when he cries out. He cries out in the previous chapter, Would I have died instead of you? Would I have died instead of you? Which is interesting. David wasn't in the battle. He couldn't have died in the battle. So what is he speaking of? Well, uh, a guy named Davis, one of the commentators, writes about this. It, really, he's going back to 2 Samuel 12. That's the template for David's sorrow. Uh, the Nathan's prophecy, to quote it for you, at least a part, uh, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So as Davis explains, David knew his sin, his sin, had set the sword loose in his household. So when he says, if only I had died instead of you, I don't think David is referring to the battle at all. I think he's traveling back in his mind 11 years. 
noting that he was the guilty party, the one who was with Bathsheba in killing Uriah, so that Absalom is suffering the consequences of David's guilt. Now stay with me. In no sense am I saying that uh, Absalom is not a guilty party as well. Of course he is. Of course he deserves to die. He's a wicked son. He's, he's done all sorts of evil, including murdering his own brother. Uh, but David is weeping over the death of his son and also this law of sowing and reaping. And he's saying, I should have died for what I did. Galatians 6, 7 is true. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Now, I will say this as a side note. Believer, if you're dealing with even right now some of the reaping that you have sown from the past, you should, you should note this. Two things. Number one, your reaping is different from an unbeliever's in two areas. Number one, you are reaping uh, from a God who loves you. And so even the reaping itself is coming from a God who loves you and knows what is best for you. And that's the second point, is that even the reaping in our lives of the things that we have sown, they're working for our good. I'm not saying they're not terribly painful, uh, but they are, even that is working for our good to make us more like Jesus Christ. So David's weeping for his son. He's, I think he's weeping mostly with this sowing and reaping aspect. But also, he, I think he's, he's weeping from the sense of regret David consistently fails to discipline his sons. You'll see this, and you see it actually later in the book. And this sort of unresolved, unmortified sin in our lives, it affects us. With time, if we don't deal with it, God sends something or perhaps someone into our lives who deals with this. And so I'm sure he has a sense of regret of what he did or didn't do in Absalom's life. And then there, it begs the question, is there anything wrong with this much weeping? I mean, 2 Samuel 1, David is weeping over King Saul, an enemy. He's weeping over Jonathan. What kind of king is this that weeps over the death of even his enemy, King Saul? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with weeping. But as, as we'll see in a moment, I think it's, it's coming to the point with David that it has become inordinate a word that we don't use all the time. It is inordinate. It's, it's inordinate is something that's out of order. It's excessive. And his weeping has made him, um, in some ways, not fit uh, to govern the way he should be governing. Proverbs 4.23 puts it like this, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow what? Springs of life. So, to quote A.W. Pink, who writes about this passage, he says, We are guilty of inordinate grief when we allow a sorrow to so overwhelm us that we are rendered incapable of discharging our duty. This is what inordinate grief produces. It makes us self-centered so that the interests of others are ignored. It takes the eye off of God when we are wholly occupied with distressing circumstances. In such an hour, we need to take hold of and act out that oft-repeated injunction, be strong and of good courage. You see, inordinate grief will not restore the dead, but will seriously injure the living. So, to be clear, there's nothing wrong with David weeping. Nothing wrong if you've lost loved ones, and I know you have. Uh, you weep with those who weep. You give space for people and you give time for them to weep. Uh, especially uh, to note that if they are weeping for believers, they are now with the Lord. They can grieve with hope. But beware that we don't weep inordinately. And I know that's, that's hard because some people need to weep more than others. Um, and I will say this, if you have the gift of confrontation, you probably shouldn't consider it your job to confront after 24 hours. Okay? And you know who you are out there. You're probably one of those folks that just needs to weep with those who weep, as the Scripture commands us. But the point of it is, is that we need to beware at all times of allowing our feelings instead of our faith to be in the driver's seat of our life. One of the commentators writes, David's problem was not in what he knew. Absalom's tragic death and David's own role in it, that's what he knew. David's problem is in what he forgot. That God, even in this, was in control. And we need to be reminded of that as well. So what we're going to see in the next few verses is Joab turns the fire hose on David. 
Actually, verses 5 and 6 are the longest Hebrew sentence in 1st or 2nd Samuel. Uh, 24 words, which is quite a bit. So we'll look at verses 5 through 8a. Continuing on, Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have covered with shame the faces of all your servants, who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore, arise, go out and speak kindly with your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you will not go out, surely not a man will pass the night with you. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. So the king arose and sat in the gate. Well, due to David's unceasing grief, Joab treats him like a, um, like, like a Dutch uncle. Now, just to be clear, I did run this past Jeanette Duncan before I mention this. Um, many will say the French uh, are perhaps the most rude of all the nationalities, and I think they probably are right. The Dutch are not rude. No, no. They are uh, straightforward. Um, some would say blunt, and I can always appreciate that about um, Dutchmen or Dutch woman. Joab, I think, is using the right words here. And he's per perhaps even right that, David, you're going to lose everything. You're in peril of winning the war against Absalom, but losing the kingdom. And to re really consider it, Joab is an enigma. When you read his story, read his life, he's faithful to David, and yet he murders other men that are in competition with him, uh, with him himself. Uh, he messed up, he messes up so much in the past and even in the future. Can David learn from a man he has lost all respect for? No, I'll ask you that question. Can you learn from somebody in whom you have lost all respect for? Well, at that time, we should point out something called common grace. That God in His kindness gives common grace to people that we just don't care for anymore. David is weary of Joab, and yet even a broken clock is right twice a day. And Joab is right here. I think he's, uh, he, I think he's warning David rightfully. And he tells him, his main point I think is this, you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. Now that's perhaps exaggerated, of course, but what is this? What is he calling out? I think he's calling out an inordinate affection that David has. Many men who love David have now sacrificed their lives. They will not go home to their families. They will have widows and orphans as children without them. They did all this to save his kingdom, and yet all David can think about is the loss of the one person who hates him more than life itself. I think it's inordinate. Um, you know, be, beware if you have ever said something to the fact of, you know what, I pray I never lose this person because if I lose this person, I can't live without that person. And I would tell you this, you can only not live without one person, and that's the Lord. He's the one who gives you life. So yes, love your families, love your friends, certainly love your enemies. But be careful, they don't become idols. So, the king does the right thing. He arose and he sat in the gate. You know what that shows about David? This man is a man of humility. You'd say a lot of things about him that he has messed up in the past, certainly. And yet he takes a strong rebuke, no matter who gives it to him. I can't help but wonder if Solomon would write this by inspiration of the Spirit later as he remembered his dad. Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And Joab uses the fire hose on him, and David says, okay, that's right. So he goes out and he congratulates the men. And one other point I'll say about David, do you think he wanted to? No. I think many of us as believers, we end up making decisions based upon how I feel. Well, I know the Bible says this, but I'm not feeling it. And you're never called to base your actions upon how you feel. 
That's a worldly mechanism. No. David realized it's the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it, even though I don't feel like it. And the men are encouraged. to take a look. Verse 8b through 10. When they told all the people, saying, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. Then all the people came before the king. Now Israel had fled. That means the enemies of, of David at this time. Israel had fled, each to his tent. All the people were quarreling throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies, saved us from the hand of the Philistines. But now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. However, Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now then, why are you silent about bringing the king back? The tribes are remembering all the victories they've had under David. They probably had to be thinking, why did we do that? Uh, David has conquered so many nations, in particular the Philistines. And so now they're not quarreling about bringing him back. They're quarreling over who gets to bring the king back to Jerusalem. Well, who's the natural choice of all the tribes? Judah. David is of the kingly tribe, Judah. So the question is, why aren't the people of Judah doing this? We'll see. Verse 11 through 15. Then King David said to Zadok and Abiathar, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the word of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house? You are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? Say to Amasa, Why, uh, rather, are you not bone of my bone? And my flesh, may God do so to me, and more also, if you will not be commander of the army, army before me continually in place of Joab. Then he turned the hearts of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, saying, Return, you and all your servants. The king then returned and came as far as the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal in order to go to meet the king, to bring the king across the Jordan." So David is sending word to the priest who are going to send a check back in. Why aren't Judah's elders bringing me back? <laughs> these, are my, these are my kin. Well, we should not forget this. And you'd know this from the last chapter. Judah really is the tip of the spear in the rebellion against David. I mean, consider this. Absalom was anointed king in Hebron. That is the city of Judah. The three principal rebels... Absalom from Judah, Ahithophel, who was David's number one counselor from Judah, and finally Amasa, also from Judah and a member of David's own family. Um, so what David does is David appeals to two points here, and it works. He appeals to their bloodlines. He says, y'all are my bone and my flesh. We're kin. Uh, you're the ones that should be bringing me back. And secondly, he appeals to their worries. What he does, he replaces Joab, it's like on the spot, which is his general, and he replaces him with Amasa, which was Absalom's general. It signals that the people of Judah or Israel, they have no need to fear the king having revenge upon them. With this move, he turned all the hearts of the men of Judah as one man. Way to go. Great move. Let's see what else happens. Now we have some new characters in the story. Verse 16 through 20. Then Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite who is from Bahurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and 20 servants with him. And they rushed to the Jordan before the king. Then they kept crossing the ford to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. So, the king, uh, rather, so he said to the king, Let not my lord consider me guilty, nor remember what your servant did wrong on the day when my lord the king came down from Jerusalem, so that the king would take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, today I am the first of all the house of Joseph. Now, the house of Joseph, sometimes you'd use that term to describe the ten northern tribes. Uh, I'm the first of all the house of Joseph to come down to meet my Lord the King. <laughs> Sounds like a little schmoozing to me, as we'll see. Now, who are these people? Well, if you haven't studied this passage, I'll try to give you just a, um, just a thumbnail sketch of each. Shimei is a Benjamite. 
of the house of Saul, he cursed David and his men and threw rocks and stones at his men and David as they fled from Jerusalem. And uh, Abishai says, I'm going to go cut off his head <laughs> to David, basically. And David says, don't touch him. Maybe the Lord has called him to curse. You need to read the whole chapter. It's fantastic. The idea is that the Lord in his sovereignty, maybe this is, he knows this is exactly what I need to humble me. So uh, that's Shimei. And uh, then we have a guy named Ziba. Ziba is Mephibosheth's servant. And if you don't know 2 Samuel, you're going, well, who's Mephibosheth? Well, I'll tell you. Mephibosheth was the paralyzed son of Jonathan, whom David had basically brought into his house and basically adopted him, sitting at the king's table, taking care of him. Uh, Ziba slandered Mephibosheth to David, saying that he wanted to stay behind in Jerusalem and recapture the kingship for the house of Saul. So, uh, and he, he was lying. That's the, the text doesn't tell you he's lying, but I think in the text you'll see it come forth that Mephibosheth was not going to turn his back on David. But David doesn't know that at this time. So here's what you have. You have Shimei and you have Ziba that are racing down uh, the banks to the Jordan uh, to welcome the king back. And y'all, that is suspect, if you ask me. Uh, Shimei falls prostrate on the ground. He admits to his guilt. He basically asks the king for forgiveness. Uh, as one of the commentators states, uh, Shimei speaks, uh, no, I'm sorry, as he speaks, uh, one forms the impression that Shimei is a snake. And yet even snakes want to live. And he realizes that. He says, I have sinned. And the question we should ask ourselves, is that repentance or remorse? Well, John 3 says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. It's a gift of God. You don't, you don't, you don't bring it about. It happens. Much in the same way of its uh, counterpart, faith. Two different sides of the same coin. We don't know if this is repentance or remorse, but I will tell you, just spoiler alert, at the end of David's life, he tells his young son Solomon, you need to kill that guy. Execute him. Um, now, keep in mind, it's against the law to curse the king, as we'll see. Uh, verse 21 through 23. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, said, Should not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? David then said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zariah? Literally what he says in the Greek is, What to you and to me? What to you and to me? Which is the idea is, what do we have in common? Nothing. Um, O oh, sons of Zariah, that you should this day be an adversary to me. Should any man be put to death in Israel today? For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? The king said to Shimei, you shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. So Abishai, one of the sons of Zariah, just like Joab, is his brother, he says, let's, let's kill him. <laughs> and um, that... It's interesting because Abishai is right. The Old Testament does prescribe you don't curse the king. He is the Lord's anointed. Uh, but David, in his wisdom here, in his mercy, he knows that the rest of the tribes might think that he, in turn, will commit revenge upon them if he does this act. And so in his incredible mercy, he rules out vengeance that day. And I get the idea that he swears to, um, to Shimei, you will not die today. Uh, he doesn't lie, uh, and you have to read the rest of the story in the book of 1 Kings about Shimei. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, David shuts down Abishai. No one's going to die today. And y'all, just to pull your, uh, the curtain back on the ancient way of doing things, if you're a king at that time, you're going to kill Shimei. There's no reason why you wouldn't. David is different from other kings. He shows this sort of miraculous mercy upon others that, that it would be sh it's shocking for us, but to that time period, it's over the top. Blows your socks off, as some would say. <laughs> Continuing on. Uh, so, Shimei bows the knee. He confesses King David upon his lips. Is it because he wants to? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. He wants to live. That's what he wants. You know, it's interesting. There's a time coming in this universe that this same sort of thing will happen. 
Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11 makes it clear that the Son of David, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think that's going to be you and I, all those that are in Christ. I think we're talking Pharaoh, Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden, Stalin, you name it, everyone. Now, we as believers will bow in homage to Him because we love Him and we know that He saved us. But even unbelievers one day will bow. You need to note that. As a matter of fact, as a friend of mine would often say in his witnessing to others, if he came across a person that was really, oh, hard-hearted and wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ, he very, my friend very kindly would say, you know, you should note this, according to Scripture, um, you can either bow now or you'll bow later. So come to Jesus. (laughs) Continuing on, let's see what happens. Verse 24 through 30, we have Mephibosheth. Then Mephibosheth, uh, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had neither three things, cared for his feet, number two, trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came home in peace. It was when he came from Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? So he answered, Oh, my lord, the king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go with the king because your servant is lame. It's interesting that Mephibosheth mentions to David. David knows he's lame. He knows he's paralyzed. And yet he quotes it. He mentions it again. Verse 27. Moreover, he has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But my lord, the king is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your sight. For all my father, or in the idea is my grandfather's household, Saul's household, was nothing but dead men before my lord, the king. Yet you set your servant among those who ate at your own table. What right do I have yet that I should complain any more to the king? So the king said to him, Why do you still speak of your affairs? I've decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Let him take it all, since my lord the king has come safely to his house. All right. You see here in verse 24, it looks like Mephibosheth has hygiene issues going on here. And he certainly does. Why hasn't he trimmed his toenails and his beard or washed his clothes? In all likelihood, he was not a high paralytic, but a low one. So he had some sort of mobility in some sense. Or at least he could have gotten somebody to take care of him, or at least something to this effect. Well, I would tell you this action kept him ceremonially unclean as long as David was away. Why did he take these actions? Well, let's think about it. His actions proclaimed loyalty to David. My true king is away. And it really was a risky move on his part. It proclaimed disloyalty to Absalom. They would look at him and say, why aren't you taking care of yourself? Why aren't you washing your clothes? You know you can't even go to the tabernacle. You're ceremonially unclean. And you smell on top of everything else. And he would say, my king is not here. I'm waiting for my king. His appearance showed to everyone that his true king David was away. Okay, now we're hitting you where you live. Are we not the same? As believers, are we not called to look, act, speak differently than the world we live in? And the reason why is because we know that our King, though with us in spirit, is away. We wait for His return. And everyone who took notice of Mephibosheth would realize that his true King is not Absalom, but David. A question worth asking yourself is, do you you think your neighbors, your associates, do you think they know that about you? Especially in the 2020s, are you, Believer's Chapel, are you prepared to look like a bad American in order to follow your true King, Jesus? Note our brethren in China, North Korea, the Middle East, and beyond, they wear that badge even as they meet in church today. Well, David believes Mephibosheth's story, or at least he seems to. So what does he do? Well, he splits the land down the middle. The land that he had given, that he had taken from Mephibosheth to Ziba, he now says, oh, just split it down the middle, which is a pragmatic move. I mean, Ziba had helped him in his time of need. 
He also lied to him about Mephibosheth. Which one is guilty? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I think Ziba, we see that he hurried to get down there. And we don't see, we see Mephibosheth has actually got certain attributes about him that show that he actually couldn't get to David. He tried, he wasn't able to. And it makes you wonder, why did David take this pragmatic approach? Why didn't he give it all to Mephibosheth? Some of the commentators think that perhaps he's testing Mephibosheth. Uh, we don't know, ultimately. We'll find out one day. But I want, you to, I want you to see five statements that Mephibosheth gives. And really what he does is he cuts short his defense about David, about himself rather. He cuts it short in order to praise the king. You'll see in these five statements his attitude towards the king and towards the king's will. And I want you to note, y'all, that's a good reflection of what we should be like towards our king. Number one, he says in verse 27, do what is good in your sight, or literally do what is good in your eyes. This isn't this what Christ says to the Father? Hebrews 10, 7, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And certainly that is true of his younger brothers as well. Lord, I've come to do your will, whatever it is. And he trusts this king to do what is right in his eyes. Number two, verse 28, all my father's household was nothing but dead men before my Lord, the king. All of them. Is this not true of us as well? Ephesians 2, 1, you were sort of alive. No, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Matthew Henry puts it like this, we were all as dead men before God, yet He has not only spared us, but taken us to sit at His own table. How little reason then have we to complain of any trouble we are in, and how much reason to take all well what God does. Number three, also in verse 28, He says, you set your servant among those who eat at your own table. This is exactly what the Lord does with His former enemies that He has now made sons and daughters. Matthew 8, 11, it makes it clear that one day we will be reclining at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Us dirty Gentiles sitting with him. Number four, he says, what right do I have yet that I should complain any more to the king? Okay, now I just got very personal, didn't I? Philippians 2, 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And the idea is that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in a wicked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as what? Lights. Problem with us, too many of us don't look like lights. We complain, we bemoan, and yet Mephibosheth says, what right have I to complain one bit? And finally, verse 30, after he hears David make a really, I think, an unwise call. He says, let Ziba take everything. Let him take everything. You know what that shows us about Mephibosheth? He's more concerned about the king's will than his own. It's like he's looking at King David and he says, I want whatever the king wants from my life, even when it is directly opposed to what I want. I want that. Or maybe how we said it this morning, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if we thought enough about it, we would say that Christ died for me, set His love upon me, my salvation is secure, I'm righteous in God's sight because of the blood of the Lamb. He gave me faith and repentance. I believed because He made that possible, because He drew me in. And not only that, is that one day when I die, I can look forward to a resurrected body. And you know what all this means? Well, it means unlike David, who judges wrongly at times, the son of David works all things for my good. And you know what that el else it means? It just doesn't matter what happens to me. It just doesn't matter what happens to me, or, or you for that matter. The Lord has got us taken care of. The question is, are you looking forward to His return? The return of the King is what we call this. Dr. Johnson put it like this, Mephibosheth illustrates an individual who waits for the return of the King, like us, 
Mephibosheth is an individual who has kindness shown to him for the sake of someone else, being Jonathan. Having waited patiently for the return of the king, the king comes, and his attitude of waiting is suggestive of the kind of attitude that you and I should have. That is the great hope that we have as redeemed individuals is the hope of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Christian people are waiting people. They are people who wait for the Lord's return from heaven. So how about you? Is that your attitude? Is the thought of our Lord's return and the hope for it prominent in your life? Or does the thought only pass through your mind occasionally? Is it a kind of dominating thought? Well, when you turn to the New Testament and read what the apostles have to say, we can see what a dominant thing it was for them. They thought of the coming of our Lord as something that was very significant and very important to them. So much so that even Apostle Paul can say in 2 Timothy 4, 8, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have what? loved His appearing. That's one of the earmarks of a believer. You love His appearing. If you look at your life right now and you say, you know, I'm really not that interested. I want to live my life. His appearing, His return, uh, whatever. You need to keep in mind that perhaps you have started to grow at a distance from our Lord. Or maybe you've never walked with Him ever. My encouragement to you today is come to Christ. He alone saves you from sin. This time I want us to go ahead and we're going to sing hymn number 55. The song is The Lord is My Salvation. And it fits with our text this morning. And so Father, we're reminded once again You are our salvation. At the end of the day, it does not matter what happens to us. We are secure in the Father's arms. We are okay. Father, we better than okay. We are righteous as the Son. Help us, Father, as we go from here, that we would live life that way. That we would realize we've got work to do. Not only work, but it's the work, the fun kind of work, that you are the one that goes ahead of us. That not only are we saved by faith, but we are also the Father's workmanship created to do good works, which God prepared in advance that we should walk in them. So, Father, help us to walk. Help us to run to the throne. And we look forward to the Son returning. And in the meantime, Lord, help us to always remember the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious upon you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.